Legendary Passages, Episode 84, Tenth Argonauts, Crete and Callisti, from the Argonautica. Previously, Jason and Medea took the Golden Fleece and set sail for Iolcus. This passage recounts their final adventures before returning home. The bronze giant Talos, the island of Anaph, Callisti, also known as Thera, and finally they returned to Iolcus. After getting lost in Libya, where Triton gave them directions and a clod of earth, the Argonauts came to the island of Crete. Unfortunately, Talos, a giant man of bronze, threw huge boulders at them and drove them off. Medea used her magical incantations to kill Talos. Then the Argonauts resupplied and sailed on. Adrift in a starless night, Phoebus Apollo answered their prayers with a distant gleam, and they sailed to the island of Anaph. They offered what they had in grateful sacrifice, despite the laughter of Medea's handmaids. The Argonaut Euphemus had a dream about that clod of earth, and Jason told him to drop it into the sea. There rose up the islands of Callisti, also known today as the supervolcano Thera. After a brief race to fetch water, the Argonauts sailed home to Iolcus. But while their journey ends here, their story is far from over. Crete and Callisti A Legendary Passage from Apollonius Rhodius Argonautica, Book 4 Translated by R. C. Seton and rugged Carpathus, far away, welcomed them, and thence they were to cross to Crete, which rises in the sea above other islands. And Talos, the man of bronze, as he broke off rocks from the hard cliff, stayed them from fastening hawsers to the shore, when they came to the roadstead of Dicte's haven. He was of the stock of bronze, of the men sprung from ash trees, the last left among the sons of the gods. And the son of Kronos gave him to Europa to be the warder of Crete, and to stride round the island thrice a day with his feet of bronze. Now in all the rest of his body and limbs he was fashioned of bronze and invulnerable, but beneath the sinew by his ankle was a blood-red vein, and this, with its issue of life and death, was covered by a thick skin. So the heroes though outworn with toil, quickly backed their ship from the land in sore dismay. And now, far from Crete, they would have borne in wretched plight, distressed by both thirst and pain, had not Medea addressed them as they turned away. Hearken to me, for I deem that I alone can subdue for you that man, whoever he be, even though his frame be of bronze throughout, unless his life too is everlasting. But be ready to keep your ship here beyond the cast of his stones, till he yield the victory to me. Thus she spake, and they drew the ship out of range, resting on their oars, waiting to see what plan, unlooked for, she would bring to pass. And she, holding the fold of her purple robe over her cheeks on each side, mounted on the deck, and Aeson's son took her hand in his, and guided her way along the thwarts and with songs she did propitiate and invoke the death spirits, devourers of life, the swift hounds of Hades, who, hovering through all the air, swoop down on the living. Kneeling in supplication, thrice she called on them with songs, and thrice with prayers, and, shaping her soul to mischief, with her hostile glance she bewitched the eyes of Talos, the man of bronze, and her teeth gnashed bitter wrath against him, and she sent forth baneful phantoms in the frenzy of her rage. Father Zeus, surely great wonder rises in my mind, seeing that dire destruction 
leads us not from disease and wounds alone, but lo, even from afar, maybe, it tortures us. So Talos, for all his frame of bronze, yielded the victory to the might of Medea the sorceress. And as he was heaving massy rocks to stay them from reaching the haven, he grazed his ankle on a pointed crag, and the ichor gushed forth like melted lead, and not long thereafter did he stand, towering on the jutting cliff. But even as some huge pine, high upon the mountains, which woodmen have left half-hewn through by their sharp axes when they returned from the forest, at first it shivers in the wind by night, then at last snaps at the stump and crashes down. So Talos for a while stood on his tireless feet, swaying to and fro, when at last, all strengthless, fell with a mighty thud. For that night there in Crete the heroes lay. Then, just as dawn was growing bright, they built a shrine to Minoan Athena, and drew water and went aboard, so that first of all they might by rowing pass beyond Salmone's height. But straightway as they sped over the Cretan wide sea, night scared them, that night which they named the Pall of Darkness. The stars pierced not that fatal night, nor the beams of the moon, but black chaos descended from heaven, or haply some other darkness came, rising from the nethermost depths. And the heroes, whether they drifted in Hades or on the waters, knew not one whit, but they committed their return to the sea, in helpless doubt whither it was bearing them. But Jason raised his hands and cried to Phoebus with mighty voice, calling on him to save them, and the tears ran down in his distress. And often did he promise to bring countless offerings to Pytho, to Amicle, and to Artigia. And quickly, O son of Leto, swift to hear, didst thou come down from heaven to the Melantian rocks, which lie there in the sea. Then darting upon one of the twin peaks, thou raisest aloft in thy right hand thy golden bow, and the bow flashed a dazzling gleam all around. And to their sight appeared a small island of the Sporides, over against the tiny isle Hipparis. And there they cast anchor and stayed, and straightway dawn arose and gave them light, and they made for Apollo a glorious abode in a shady wood and a shady altar, calling on Phoebus the gleamer, because of the gleam far seen, and that bare island they call an aff, for that Phoebus had revealed it to men sore bewildered. And they sacrificed all that men could provide for sacrifice on a desolate strand. Wherefore, when Medea's Phaeacian handmaids saw them pouring water for libations on the burning brands, they could no longer restrain laughter within their bosoms, for that ever they had seen oxen in plenty slain in the halls of Alcinous. And the heroes delighted in the jest, and attacked them with taunting words, and merry railing and contention flung to and fro were kindled among them. And from that sport of the heroes such scoffs do women fling at the men in that island whenever they propitiate with sacrifices Apollo the gleaming god, the warder of an aff. But when they had loosened the hawsers thence in fair weather, then Euphemus bethought him of a dream of the night, reverencing the glorious son of Maia. For it seemed to him that the god-given clod of earth held in his palm close to his breast was being suckled by white streams of milk, and that from it, little though it was, grew a woman like a virgin, and he, overcome by strong desire, lay with her in love's embrace and united with her he pitied her, as though she were a maiden whom he was feeding with his own milk. But she comforted him with gentle words. Daughter of Triton am I, dear friend, and nurse of thy children, no maiden. Triton and Libya are my parents. But restore me to the daughters of Nereus to dwell in the sea near Anaf. I shall return again to the light of the sun to prepare a home for thy descendants. Of this he stored in his heart the memory, and declared it to Aeson's son. And Jason pondered a prophecy of the far darter, and lifted up his voice, and said, My friend, great and glorious renown has fallen to thy lot. For of this clod, when thou hast cast it into the sea, the gods will make an island, 
where thy children's children shall dwell. For Triton gave this to thee as a stranger's gift from the Libyan mainland. None other of the immortals it was than he that gave thee this when he met thee. Thus he spake, and Euphemus made not vain the answer of Aeson's son, but, cheered by the prophecy, he cast the clod into the depths. Therefrom rose up an island, Callisti, sacred nurse of the sons of Euphemus, who in former days dwelt in Sintian Lemnos, and from Lemnos were driven forth by Tyrrhenians, and came to Sparta as suppliants. And when they left Sparta, Theros, the goodly son of Artesian, brought them to the island Callisti, and from himself he gave it the name of Thera. But this befell after the days of Euphemus. And thence they steadily left behind long leaves of sea, and stayed on the beach of Aegina. And at once they contended in innocent strife about the fetching of water, who first should draw it and reach the ship. For both their need and the ceaseless breeze urged them on. There, even to this day, do the ewes of the Myrmidon take up on their shoulders full brimming jars, and with swift feet strive for victory in the race. Be gracious, race of blessed chieftains, and may these songs, year after year, be sweeter to sing among men. For now have I come to the glorious end of your toils, for no adventure befell you as ye came home from Aegina, and no tempest of winds opposed you, but quietly did ye skirt the Cecropian land, and all is inside of Euboa, and the Optunian cities of the Locrians, and gladly did ye step forth upon the beach of Pegase. This passage concludes Apollonius Rhodius, Argonautica. But our next passage revisits the first love of Jason, Queen Hypsipyle. <laughs>